Great. Thanks so much. I am uh, I'm super happy to be here. Um, and uh, so this is uh, some joint work that I'm going to describe uh, that I did uh, with my, I guess, master's student, soon to be PhD student, uh, Sid Sheff. All right. So um, here's the idea. Um, here's the problem. So I, I want to do data analysis in the space of persistence diagrams. Oh, my camera's in the way. Here, you don't need to see me for a moment. Um, so <clears throat> what does this mean? Uh, there's a, a bunch of different perspectives you could take on this problem, um, on what this even means to do data analysis. Um, you can think of it in terms of statistics, like there's statistical problems. There are geometric uh, problems. And, but for today, what I really want to focus is on the metric structure. So if you are not familiar with persistence diagrams or the standard metric, I'll define these in a second. Um, but this is, uh, this is kind of the high level problem that we're going after, how to do data analysis in the space of persistence diagrams. All right, let's move my camera up here so that we can uh, see this. All right. And, um, the hope is that the talk will be, I'm going to take it kind of slow and it should be pedagogical. You should ask, stop and ask me questions because um, uh, the, the approach I'm going to describe here, I really believe is, should become an absolute standard thing that anyone who wants to do data analysis on the space of persistence diagrams should do. In fact, I, I hope to convince you actually that like, it would be a bad idea to not use these sketches that I'm going to describe. Um, all right, so let's see. What are the definitions? So uh, what is a persistence diagram for this talk? All right, so a persistence diagram is going to just be a subset of the plane. And it contains the diagonal. All right, so we're going to require it to contain all these points x, x, such that, you know, for x and r. So it contains that whole diagonal line. Uh, we're going to only consider what, what we'll call finite persistence diagrams which means that they only have finitely many points that are off the diagonal. Obviously, the diagonal has a lot of points, um, but off the diagonal, there's only a finite number of them. These are the ones that would naturally um, occur in data analysis. And for this talk, I'm going to say no infinite points. And so if you, if you work in this field, you sometimes uh, pretty much always end up with some points at infinity, something that looks like, say, zero infinity. Um, and we are not going to include those. Um, and uh, the reason is just that actually as a metric, it's a little bit, it takes a bit of work to wrangle the space of persistence diagrams into an actual metric if you have points at infinity. Um, or at least you end up with a lot of infinite distances, a whole, a whole bunch of mess that we're just not going to deal with. We're just going to throw out any points that are infinite. All right. So that's what a persistence diagram is. Let's start see a picture. So here's one, right? I've got a diagonal line uh, and a bunch of points. Uh, some of you might be uncomfortable with this because I, I drew some of the points below the diagonal. So where do these things come from? Uh, most often, uh, persistence diagrams arise from doing some kind of um, topological data analysis where the input uh, was some kind of filtered simplicial complex or filtered cell complex. Uh, and the diagram is actually describing birth and death times of topological features that appear in the course of that filtration. So if you just think of like a set of points where edges appear and triangles appear at certain times, and then you ask like what, what happens to the homology as those changes happen, uh, those changes appear in the diagram where each of these, this, say this point right here, has some birth time, and its height here is its death time. So a topological feature appears and dies. And uh, the field of persistent homology is full of this kind of um, little bit extreme vocabulary of births and deaths and killing. And, uh, <laughs> and so it seems quite dramatic, um, but really it's just a point set in the plane. And, um, and some of you, like I said, might be uncomfortable. Some people put points below the diagonal too. There's reasons for doing that. It seems a little strange because it would mean that somehow you died before you were born. Um, it's a little bit like that Hitchcock movie, Vertigo. Um, 
but uh, there are actually legitimate reasons for doing this. And um, um, so it, for the sake of the algorithms I'm going to describe, it literally doesn't matter at all if the points are below the diagonal. All right. So if I have a, a persistence diagram like this and I have a second persistence diagram, I need another color. Let's, well, I'll go with the red here. Like, so say I have some other persistence diagram with some points. Um, this one here, here. Maybe that's it. Maybe this is my other persistence diagram. Hopefully the red is clear. Ah, uh, maybe I'll make them X's. I know that the colors don't always come through so clearly. All right, so I've got this other persistence diagram. Now, the standard metric between the persistence diagrams as the, diff the distance that I'm going to describe between the black points and the red X's is defined as follows. I'm going to look for a matching, uh, let's call it M, where it just kind of matches one point from each. But I'm allowed to do the following. I'm allowed to match with a diagonal. So any, all the off-diagonal points have to be matched with someone with a point from the other set, from the other diagram. But um, if necessary, I can match them to the diagonal. So I'll draw it like this, I guess. And then the metric, the distance here, is the bottleneck of this matching, which is to say it's the maximum over all the, these pairs of the distance between the pairs. And we're going to measure the distance in L infinity. I need a new Sharpie. Uh, here we go. So let's say the distance from x to, if we call the matching m, let's say, just call it m of x. Okay. So the distance between each point and its matched point. Now, Sometimes this is defined where, uh, in order to make it like a, a matching over the entire um, diagrams, that you, you add the diagonal in with like infinite multiplicity, and then you have some kind of multi-matching thing going on. Um, but uh, it's much cleaner to write it this way because it's also now clear that this is a finite problem that can be solved with finite in finite time by just standard combinatorial matching algorithms. Um, there's one thing I, I missed here, so um, let me just go back for a second to the definition. Um, uh, I said it's a set, but really it could be a multi-set. And this is going to be uh, absolutely crucial um, to everything we do. <laughs> um, and, uh, and just maybe uh, when I use this, this condition about being finite, we'll call these finite persistence diagrams. But like I said, we'll assume all the diagrams are finite, um, and they, they could be multi-sets. So I'm going to allow multiplicity of the points. And uh, in a lot of standard topological data analysis, you get multiplicity in the diagram. You get points that appear multiple times. All right, so this is the uh, bottleneck distance between two persistence diagrams. Uh, Well-defined, it's solved by some matching algorithms. There's um, uh, Engineer, let's call it engineered code to do this uh, as fast as they know how. Um, but I'm going to just tell you it's slow. Uh, so my other PhD student, uh, Kirk Gardner, does a lot of topological data analysis. He works with computational chemists where they do um, data analysis on these diagrams. And they produce huge numbers of diagrams. And if you have to compute many bottleneck distances, it becomes, OK, I apologize for the pun, but it becomes the bottleneck of all your computation is computing bottleneck distances. And, um, and so um, it makes sense to try to do something faster. So you could, you could approach this two ways. Like one is you could say, like, let's make better matching algorithms. Um, um, but there's another approach too, which is like, we, like let's just settle for approximations and see if we can um, do pretty well pretty fast. Or let's say, or maybe we could do pretty well, but much faster, and, and hopefully get a win this way. Now, as I said, um, the point was to do a kind of metric data analysis. So just to give you an idea of the kinds of problems we're interested in, we're thinking about problems like uh, nearest neighbor search. I give you a collection of persistence diagrams, and a new one comes along, and I want to know which of my the ones I've seen is this new one closest to. Or, for instance, if I have some classification. Uh, like I have labels on my persistence diagram, I might want to find the k nearest ones. The k, like I pick some k and I say, give me the k nearest uh, persistence diagrams. And maybe I'll do classification this way by taking, say, 
letting my nearest neighbors vote on the label for the new one. Um, or range search, just find all the persistence diagrams from my data set that are in some range, um, let's say that are within a certain distance of a, of, uh, of a certain diagram. Um, or just other unsupervised learning problems like clustering. Or I guess I didn't put it on here, but if you want to get really meta, you could ask to try to do persistent homology of a family of persistent persistence diagrams, in which case, again, um, you would need the metric. Um, uh, or maybe you, you really want to do geometry. You're like committed to doing geometry, so you can try to embed a collection of persistence diagrams into a geometric space. Um, so like using, say, multidimensional scaling, you could do that. Um, or things like spanners, like a spanner as a, as a standard construction. I'm sorry, the, the specific construction is not standard, but the, the, the concept is um, standard in a lot of algorithms where you try to build a sparse graph that represents your metric well. Um, so um, maybe I have n diagrams. I have n choose two pairwise relationships, but maybe there's a, a small number of, of pairs that actually um, capture most of the metric. And so that gives me a graph and maybe shortest paths in the graph aren't too much longer than the actual distance. So these are um, a bunch of kind of maybe the most common types of metric data analysis questions. And here's an interesting fact. I guess uh, for this list, with the exception, I'll say, of uh, MDS, um, but maybe MDS would also help, for many of these problems, uh, approximations, it, uh, oh, I won't write it all out. Approximations are, are good enough. And what I mean by that is for a search, if I'm searching through a space, uh, like nearest neighbor search is a, is a problem for which it's, if you can compute distances, it's really easy to write correct code to do nearest neighbor search because I just loop over all the ones I have. I compute all the distances and I find the smallest distance. And there's my nearest neighbor. Um, but to do it more efficiently, the goal is usually to try to not search places, to actually do what we call pruning the search tree. So if I find that some point is far away compared to uh, my, uh, another nearest neighbor I've found, if, I, if that point's far away, then not only do I need to, I, maybe I, if I've computed that distance, I don't need to compute the distance if I know that many points are close to that one. Because if it's far and they're close, then by the triangle inequality, all the near neighbors there are also far, and I just don't search there. Um, and this is the basis for most metric data structures. Right? So, um, so that when I say good enough, I really mean good enough to prune a search. And so if we go to approximations and we, we replace our exact distance computation with something approximate, um, it's not, it doesn't necessarily lead to error. It might just mean that we can use the approximate distance to, to prune a search, and we just get an improved running time, um, and that's it. Right? We get with, it's just far enough means we don't search there, and approximation is good enough to give us um, that pruning. All right. So, um, it, if if all of this is at some point at some level directed towards uh, efficiency, then we should think about how uh, within TCS here is theoretical computer scientists always like the canon of theoretical computer science is to analyze the running time of algorithms as a function of the input size. Um, this is actually a little weird because you might wonder if it means that if I figure out how to compress my input, um, maybe my algorithm is worse <laughs> because if I, I have the same input but somehow I just made it smaller. Um, and actually, sometimes that's true. Um, but uh, it, this, this idea points us at something else, which is that if I want to speed up the running time of bottleneck distance computations, my, my best, one of my best options might be to just have smaller persistence diagrams, to reduce the size of the diagrams. I'm finding a matching. Let's say the diagrams have like n points. I'm finding a matching on a graph with two n vertices and um, something like n squared edges. Um, if, I, if n is smaller, then, then I'm going to get some improvement there. So, um, yeah, so that's going to be our big idea. Let's use smaller persistence diagrams. And if this was, uh, um, 
if this was just a pure matching problem and we didn't have persistence diagrams, but just like sub finite subsets in the plane, we would be out of luck here for this because um, the cardinality of two sets has to be the same in order for there to be a matching between them. Um, but because there's this diagonal and because we can pair things with a diagonal, you can compare persistence diagrams with different cardinalities and um, at least different cardinalities of the number of off diagonal points. So, so there's some hope here. Maybe we can just use fewer points. And I'm going to warm us up here with um, a toy problem, which is not the main problem we want to solve, but it's very close. So if I want to approximate a persistence diagram D, um, and I, want, I'm, I give myself a budget. I say, look, you're just allowed k points. So find a diagram that only has k points, and it minimizes the bottleneck distance between the diagram I want and my approximation. So it's as close as possible that I can get with just k points. Um, I'll bet some of you can see immediately how to solve this problem optimally. Like it's not too crazy because, uh, you know, if I, if, I, if I only have k points, then I can only match k of the off diagonal points of D. So every other point in D has to be matched to the diagonal. And so the length of those edges is the distance to the diagonal. So if I can only match k points, I, might, I, I can't do better than matching the k points that are farthest from the diagonal. Um, so um, in fact, that's optimal. So for this version of the problem, uh, yeah, you just take the k points farthest from the diagonal. So the distance to the diagonal is, um, it's like, uh, what is it, half of the difference between the birth and the death, or the death minus birth. So it's, um, it's also known as the persistence of that point, or it's half the persistence of that point. So if we just take the points that have the maximum persistence, <clears throat> uh, that's optimal. Okay, so uh, all right. So as a, it seems like, all right. Well, if I if I want to, if I have my budget k points, it's all I can do. Um, this is the best you can do. In fact, uh, there's a there's work where people do this, right? This is a, maybe a a normal way to try to simplify your diagram because the like viewed from the other perspective, it's like I'm just going to keep throwing out points that are near the diagonal. I'm going and I'm, until I get down to a size that I that I like. Um, and so if this is the problem we wanted to solve, it would be, um, it would be done. Um, but I think there's actually, there's actually something you could do that's a little bit better. Because remember, uh, these aren't just sets, they're multi-sets. And so if I care about the size of uh, the representation here, uh, storing the points plus a multiplicity is still just order k space. Right? I just now have um, birth, death, and multiplicity. And so for k points now allowing multiplicity, um, um, maybe I can get a better approximation. So, um, so the key here is now I'm going to say I, I take k distinct points, and I want to um, minimize, again, the bottleneck distance between my diagram and this k distinct point sketch. I'll call these k point sketches. So, um, from now on, if I say a k point sketch, I just mean that there are k distinct points, but they have multiplicity, so there could be more. Um, the total mass, if you view the diagram as a measure, which is not too uncommon, uh, the total mass is, um, could be more than k. And as I said here, the size of this sketch is still order k. And um, uh, this problem is harder. I don't know how hard it, how hard it is. So uh, as a theoretical computer scientist, you know, I always want to know, like, is it NP hard? Like, is this uh, one of these, these notoriously hard problems? And it probably is. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and say probably. It's very close uh, to one. It is a special case of a well-known um, uh, well uh, NP hard problem. But we'll see that in a second. Um, but before I go into how we're going to try to tackle this, because I, I claim we don't really know how to compute this um, this optimal dk 
efficiently, so we're only going to approximate it. Um, but it will turn out that the approximation has other wonderful properties that are maybe even better than an optimal solution, which kind of will be hopefully interesting in its own right. But before we do that, I just want to argue for a moment why um, n this new um, representation, let's say, of a diagram as a multiset with multiplicities, um, that having multiplicities isn't, shouldn't really blow up the cost of computing the bottleneck distance. And this, like, this needs to be said because um, if you were to use some standard um, algorithms for computing the bottleneck distance, you would have to pay for the total mass or like the sum of the multiplicities of the diagram as opposed to just the number of distinct points. And I, I put here that matching algorithms don't depend on the max multiplicity. So really what I mean is good matching algorithms or that's sort of mean. Uh, there are good, there are cool, interesting algorithms that do, but uh, if you look at uh, most of the uh, literature on on algorithms for, for various kinds of matching problems, a huge number of them at some level turn into problems about max flow. Where if you have, in this case, if I have a bipartite matching problem where there's some bipartite graph here, I won't draw it all out, but what I do is I augment this with two special vertices, usually called S and T. And now I try to find a maximum flow where the capacity on these edges is just one. And so if I, I can find, for instance, a perfect matching, if I can find a flow, um, which is, um, uh, which the amount of flow that I can push is equal to, say, the size of one side. So um, many standard algorithms have this, um, at some level can be interpreted or sometimes it were explicitly written in terms of max flow algorithms. And um, um, uh, the history of max flow algorithms has the same, actual, same process where uh, certain early algorithms depended on what kind of capacities you put on these. So for instance, if I actually group these, if actually these three points are the same point and I just wanted to treat this as one uh, edge of capacity three, um, early max flow algorithms actually included the maximum capacity, integer capacity, as a parameter uh, describing the running time of the algorithm. But then, um, you know, improvements over the decades, you know, pretty quickly got rid of these. Uh, so the standard way to do bottleneck matching, I would say, I, should, I say it's standard, uh, the thing you'll find implemented, say, um, in uh, scikit-tda, or uh, Hera. Hera also implements another algorithm, which we'll talk about as well. Um, but uh, Hera is, is a package for computing bottleneck distance. But many of them are ba first based on this idea from the Hopcroft-Karp algorithm. Um, and the Hopcroft-Karp algorithm was adapted to deal uh, with multi-sets and multi-edges. And actually, you can see that this should work even once you learn that this Hopcroft-Karp algorithm for bipartite matching is also just a special case of, uh, of a max flow algorithm called uh, Dinitz's algorithm. And so, um, so just ha having uh, multiplicities in our set is not going to affect the asymptotic running time. We're still going to get the same kind of running time uh, independent of the multiplicities. And uh, as I mentioned, the, the kind of fastest known, um, like highly engineered code for computing bottleneck distance, Hera also implements uh, this, uh, these auction-based algorithms. And uh, these are also good for other kinds of uh, Wasserstein metrics. And actually, in the, in the journal version of this paper, they, they, they go into a little bit more detail about how it really does do even better when you have multiplicity. Um, so, um, so fewer points with higher multiplicity um, uh, creates opportunity for, for big improvement. Okay, so that's, that's the way we're gonna try to do our approximations now. We're gonna try to have a small number of points and then just give them some weight. And I claim that actually, once you pick the points, if, since, you're all, since we get to choose what our approximation is, once you pick the points, 
it's pretty clear where to put the weight. Or I'm sorry, I'm using weight for multiplicity here. It's pretty clear what to set the multiplicities to. Because let's take this diagram, for example, if I just pick these two points, um, I would just look to see among all the other points, uh, I map them to their closest point of the two that I've chosen, or I, the diagonal if that's closer. And now the multiplicity should just be how many points did I map there? Because if I set the multiplicities this way, um, well, I should give a name to these points. These are sometimes called the reverse nearest neighbors. So uh, the multiplicity is the number of reverse nearest neighbors. And um, if I do that, then it's also pretty clear what the uh, what a good matching would be, right? So the matching will just map the points again to their nearest point. And that's actually the best I could do. If I had to, choose, if I had to uh, match one of these points somewhere else, I can't decrease the bottleneck distance because I had to match it to something even farther. So if, if I know uh, I choose my, well, let's call them the centers, um, then the multiplicities are set and it also basically establishes what the um, uh, what the multiplicity should be, and I uh, oh I drew some underlines here um, <clears throat> um, because uh, I'm going to just just to make sure that things are really a proper metric um, later on uh, when I draw an underline through a underneath a multi set I just mean the ground set so I just think of the distinct points so. When I say that dk has k distinct points, even though it's a multiset, uh, I mean that the off diagonals of this, the size of the off diagonals of the underlying version, that is the base set without multiplicities, is k. <clears throat> okay, so if that's our, um, if that's how we're going to choose multiplicities, then uh, something kind of cute happens, which is that the bottleneck distance between uh, our diagram and our sketch is actually now equal to the Hausdorff distance between these sets. Now, uh, what is the Hausdorff distance? So the Hausdorff distance is a lot like the bottleneck distance, except it doesn't require that it's a matching. It just has to be a mapping. Right? There's just some way that you can find, map every point in one set to, another, uh, to the other set with distance less than the Hausdorff distance. So that's what uh, the Hausdorff distance would then be the infimum over all the points of the, so, uh, um, sorry, so the supremum over all the points of the minimum distance to the other set. Now, uh, bottleneck distance, we didn't, it wasn't, I, as far as I know, uh, not a lot of work on how to approximate it. But uh, finding good Hausdorff approximations, this is a problem that's pretty well established. And actually, if you look at this picture, it's, it's, uh, there's a perspective from which the idea I'm going to present here is really obvious, which is that clearly if I only need to pick a small number of points, I'm just doing clustering on the persistence diagram. Like someone gave me a diagram and I needed to reduce it to a small number of points like k, maybe I just want uh, some kind of clustering. And if I looked at what the objective function is, which is the maximum distance, well, that's a well-known clustering problem. That's just k center clustering. The only oddity is the diagonal, is that somehow the diagonal serves, sits in here as one special point. Um, and uh, that does cause a little bit of, uh, let's just say headache, because if I treat the diagonal as one point, which has all these reverse nearest neighbors, um, then I actually don't have a metric space anymore, because um, two points that are close to the diagonal but far from each other you know, they're both close to the diagonal, so I would break the triangle inequality because I could go from a point to the di point to the diagonal, then from the diagonal to the other point, and it would be a small distance even though they're far. And it turns out that just the, um, the impact of the diagonal on these as a metric space is, is where a lot of the kind of the little technicalities creep in. Um, but for the most part, it's, it looks like a standard um, K-center problem. So this is, K-center is the NP-hard problem that I had alluded to. Um, so in general, metric spaces, uh, K-center is NP-hard. But I don't know, um, maybe someone knows, uh, if K-center is NP-hard 
for L infinity in the plane. It might not be. Um, all right. So how do we um, approximate k-center now? How am I going to find k points to minimize the maximum distance to some set? And I'm choosing them as a subset, so it makes it nice, finite, again, nice combinatorial problem. I had a diagram D. I'm just going to take a subset of the distinct points um, and try to, um, try to get this good bottleneck approximation. So what I'll do is I, the, I start with just D0 is going to be my initial sketch. It's just a diagonal. It's like I added no points. <laughs> um, and I, so I have my diagram is just a diagonal. And uh, that's not me. Yeah, there we go. Um, and so after I start from there, every success, I'm just going to add the points one at a time. And what I'll do is I'll choose PI so that the distance from PI to my previous sketch, DI, um, is exactly equal to the Hausdorff distance between DI and D. Uh, what does that mean? Well, since it's a subset, the Hausdorff distance here is just the farthest point, right? It's determined by how, what point in D is farthest from any of the points in DI, including the diagonal here. So um, uh, this term right here, we're going to we call this thing epsilon i. And uh, oh, I didn't tell you what, I guess, well, it should be clear, hopefully, that di is just all the points I've selected so far. So this is p0 up to p i minus 1. And when I say the distance from a point to a set, I mean the distance to the closest point in the set. Uh, questions about this? All right. Um, all right, and so you just repeat until i equals k. And this is called a greedy permutation. And uh, a wonderful, well-known fact here is that this is what's called a, a net. So epsilon k, again, is that distance from that kth point to the, um, or in this case, I guess it would be the k plus first point down to the kth diagram, um, is, uh, has these two properties. One we call the packing property. All the points are separated by at least epsilon k. It also has this covering property that the entire diagram D, every point in there is within epsilon k of my other diagram. And not only that, but it has this optimality uh, property that it's a two approximation to the closest um, k point diagram to D. So here, um, this is analogous to a similar result for arbitrary metric spaces. You can do this greedy permutation if you don't start, even if you don't have a diagonal, you can start with an arbitrary point, do a greedy permutation, and get a two approximation. And then in that case, it's a two approximate k center. And uh, so, what does this mean? I guess, in other words, if someone gave me the best possible k point diagram, so if k point, let's call it opt k, is uh, the closest k point diagram to D, then the distance, the bottleneck distance between D and my sketch is at most twice the bottleneck distance between D and the opt. Okay, so I might ha not have the best one, but within a factor of two, it is. All right, I'm not going to go through this proof. It's pretty standard. Actually, was invented twice in the same year, back in 1985, I think. Um, just in the, in the context of case center clustering. Um, so this is kind of a, one of our first results in here. And uh, something else maybe jumps out at you, which is that we didn't just compute one sketch. Like if you were wondering, well, all right, who chooses K? But one possible answer is no one. Just take all the Ks. Um, because we can continue this um, greedy uh, permutation, this far, it's also called the farthest point sampling. We just keep going until we've taken all the points. And what we would get is a sequence of sketches from D0 all the way up to Dn, uh, where Dn is just the whole diagram. And if I define, again, epsilon i to be the distance between the ith sketch, as, and you can also think of this as the error of the ith sketch, we, it necessarily is true that epsilon 0 is greater than or equal to epsilon 1 
all the way to um, epsilon n, which is equal to zero. So we actually have a sequence of persistence diagrams that converges to the true diagram. So for any k, we have um, a diagram, a k-point diagram. And this is the sense in which the approximation might even be better than having the opt solution for given k because we have this nesting property. Uh, and you could also think of this as a, as a kind of progressive sketch. So I give you a sketch, and if you want, you want to progress further, you want it like an even finer resolution, you can just move on from the one you had. You don't have to throw it out. So um, I told you that it was really, really important to think about the size of the input. So how big now is this sketch going to be? Um, I have uh, the sequence of diagrams. In order to represent just the distinct points, it's basically free because if I was going to store a file that had a bunch of points in a persistence diagram, I could just order those points according to the greedy permutation. And then for any k, I would take the first k points in that ordering. So finding out what the distinct points are uh, is still just linear space. On the other hand, I, don't, I need to also store the multiplicities. And there's a bit of a trick here because when I add a new point, I change the multiplicities of other points that were previously added. So this is a, a, just in a picture. Like here are two points. They both have multiplicity 5. They each have five reverse nearest neighbors. If I add the point in between, this point gets 4. Um, these points, this one goes down to 2. This one goes down to 4. So I've decreased the radius. I've got finer approximation. I've gone from two to three points in my, distinct points in my diagram, but I had to actually change all the other multiplicities when I added this new point. So naively, it looks like um, to go from uh, di to di plus one, maybe I need to store i plus one multiplicities as well, which would blow up the total size of this thing to something like order n squared, um, which is really not um, something we want to do. Okay, but there's a, there's a fix here. So in, it could happen that the multiplicities change, um, but it could be they don't. In fact, maybe most of them don't, and maybe we can prove that. So um, if, most of the, um, if most of the multiplicities don't change, w what we could do is we could just store the ones that do change. So I say, look, point five changed from, it lost this much mass. And all the mass, we know where it goes. It goes to the new point. Um, and so if we could just bound the number of points that get affected by the insertion of pi, uh, we'd be in good shape. So, um, so this is our question, right? Like how many um, points will have their multiplicity changed? And here's where we're going to use our, um, some of these properties of the greedy permutation. So we used the, the greedy permutation partly to get our optimality result, our, our approximation guarantee, would be a two approximation. But also, um, if, if so let's say Q and R are points that had uh, their multiplicity change. Let's start with Q. Um, if the multiplicity change, it meant there was some point in the neighborhood of Q that's now in the neighborhood of, of PI. And since PI was the farthest one I took and it had distance epsilon i away, it meant that this point is less than or equal to epsilon i from both of them. And so just by the triangle inequality, any point that was affected um, has to be within 2 epsilon i of point PI. Uh, so that's just triangle inequality and greedy. And then um, if I have two of these points, Q and R, they can't be too close together. In fact, they have to be at least um, they have to be at least epsilon i apart. And the reason is because the greedy ordering, if those two are closer than that, then one of those should have been um, then pi should have been added before one of those. Right? That's just the the greedy ordering of the algorithm. So these are um, epsilon i apart. So I know I have points that are in this um, in this box of side length for epsilon, for epsilon i. And if I shrink a, bo a, a box to a, a radius epsilon i over 2 around each of these points, those points have, those boxes have to be disjoint. So if I have disjoint squares that fit into this larger square where this is, uh, um, 
right? So a point, I guess I can go out. Uh, I think, oh, I, I guess I can tighten up the bound here, but let's just say that this is within, um, yeah, so if I grow this out by another epsilon i over two, it contains the whole square. So I've got some number, some number n of these points that were affected. And if I add up the areas here, the areas are epsilon i squared. Since they all, they're disjoint and they fit in this other box, it has to be less than the area of that larger box. And so um, this just implies pretty immediately that n is less than or equal to 25. So there really are only a constant number. In fact, you can't actually get 25 because um, they have to be far from p i2, so maybe 24. Um, I don't know like what the whether you can realize even that many. So chances are you're going to see many fewer than that. But in the worst case, it's still a constant. So um, uh, if I only store the difference in the multiplicities from one sketch to the next, then I only have to store a constant amount of data. Uh, right? So it leads to this, this theorem that the greedy sketches I've described, they can be re uh, represented in order n space. All right, so I've only blown up the space by maybe a small constant factor, and, um, and now I have uh, what I think is, is quite powerful. Right? It's, uh, I can now give, give you this approximation um, for pretty much any epsilon as well. Because you can store the epsilons as well, and then you can actually know what the error is. You say, look, I, I, I can choose how many points I want. I can give myself a size budget, or I can give myself an error budget and just take as many points as I need to get to that error budget. Um, uh, um, all right, so how long does this thing take to compute? There is a naive algorithm that runs in n squared time. Um, if you look in the paper, there's, uh, I show how to adapt uh, an existing algorithm uh, to get this down to um, order n times log of, uh, this is called the spread. Um, I should write out what it really is. So uh, in our case, it's just going to be, um, it's the ratio of like the largest pairwise distance to the shortest pairwise distance. Um, this comes up a lot in geometric algorithms where you're doing a kind of geometric divide and conquer. So if you spend constant time to get down this, the scale down by half, like how many times do you have to go down by half before you can only ever see one point at a time? And so uh, another way to think of that in terms of the, I guess the terms we've used would be epsilon zero, which was the distance from the diagonal to the farthest point, um, divided by epsilon n minus one, which would be the distance from the last point I added to its nearest neighbor. And um, actually from this same analysis, it implies that if you did have a, just a, an error budget, that you, you only care about getting error down to say, um, um, oops, you just want error less than, uh, let's say epsilon k, then the running time, you just stop the algorithm early. And you stop and you, you pay something like n log epsilon 0 over epsilon k. All right, so um, uh, this mostly just involves uh, these algorithms. You can look them up in the paper. Um, most of it is just how do you do the bookkeeping in order to keep track of which points are mapped to the diagonal? because most of the analysis of these greedy permutations algorithms depend on locality and the triangle inequality. And if you have some points are near the diagonal, um, then uh, they might not actually be close to, um, to two points that are both near the diagonal are necessarily close to each other. All right. Um, here's where um, I think there are uh, a bunch of really interesting open problems. In the paper, uh, which you can find on my website, it'll appear at, at SOCG this year, this summer. Um, we have some results on this, but I think, uh, I think a lot more can be done here. So if I have a sketch uh, and I compute the distance from my sketch to some other diagram. So far, we were interested in approximation uh, uh, errors and things like this. So we were always comparing the sketch to the original diagram. But obviously, the point is to be able to use the sketch in lieu of the diagram to compare it to something else. Let's call it x. 
And so if I compute the distance from my k-point sketch to x, then um, can I use or reuse some of that computation in order to compute, say, uh, k plus 1 to x? Um, and so there are a couple obvious things to try. And, um, and we, show, um, we show some ways of doing this. So if you think about what, when we store the diffs uh, in the multiplicities, what we're actually storing there is uh, what's sometimes called a transportation plan. We're saying, like, look, all these points who lost some mass, it all went to the new point pi. And so we're saying, like, in order to get from uh, the kth sketch to the k plus first sketch, you just have to move this much mass from these points to these other points. And a transportation plan encodes actually a whole equivalence class of possible matchings. Um, uh, and so you might hope that you can take um, a good matching out of that equivalence class of the, among the, the that you've already stored, and you can compose the matchings to try to get a good start towards computing this bottleneck distance. Now, um, we don't have any solid results here because it's not clear how to get, let's say, asymptotic improvement, but it seems that practically it's probably the right thing to do because it gives you a, a really good start in terms of gives you a good matching. Um, for uh, these two diagrams, uh, from which um, you could then run the standard, um, the standard matching algorithms, which work from a matching and then they constantly improve it. So having a good head start seems like this would help, but coming up with strong theoretical guarantees for that is still open. Um, there's another um, thing that came up in running in. In writing this paper was that one of the motivations we thought was going to be a real selling point was that m the state-of-the-art algorithms for computing bottleneck distance they use these geometric data structures to not store the neighborhood graph that is uh, if I want to know if there's if the bottleneck distance is uh, less than epsilon what I do is I connect every point to its neighbors with an epsilon and just try to find any perfect matching and if there's any perfect matching, that means that there's a matching with that the bottleneck distance is less than epsilon. Um, so um, it, it was historically so starting like a series of results, like I guess in the early 90s, maybe late 80s, these geometric matching problems, people said, ah, no, 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 you have to use a geometric data structure. Don't build that graph. Just kind of find it as you go by searching geometrically, like locally. Um, and we thought, well, that would be great because actually if you compute the greedy permutation, you've, you've actually pre-computed a lot of the information you would need to build one of these data structures. So it seemed like that was going to be great too because we pre-processed the, the diagram and it pre-processed it in a way that also gives you uh, the data structure that you were going to need anyway. And then uh, we found that actually um, with the sketches, uh, maybe you should build the graph. And the reason is that if you care about an error that's, let's say, in the range of the Hausdorff distance, I'll write it like this, so if it's like within a constant factor of the Hausdorff distance, then um, rather than trying uh, this geometric search uh, approach, you can build the graph in in uh, linear time and linear space. Um, so because the, you get a graph on the sketches, and uh, as long as the sketch, it, you, you only refine the sketches down to the number of points that looks like the, the Hausdorff distance, the degree is bounded. So you, you end up with this linear size graph, and you can extract it um, with a little preprocessing pre in uh, in linear time. So um, it might be that uh, once you have sketches, it changes entirely how you would um, even approach the problem of, of uh, well, approximating bottleneck distance. All right. Um, some other open questions I think uh, are compelling. One is to think about sketches that preserve other structure. So for instance, you might want a sketch that is actually a submodule that corresponds to a submodule of um, 
the persistence module that you started with, right? That the, the diagram is actually a summary or a description of the of, a, of some persistence module. So you might want to actually have the sketch have some algebraic structure. And it, we kind of know how to do this. Um, and uh, there's a couple other variations of this problem. But you can think about how do you approximate and still get um, maybe some other, your approximation having some other topological meaning. And um, it's also, as I mentioned, still kind of open to have algorithms for computing the bottleneck distances that really exploit the sketches. Because it seems like there's there's um, there's a lot of uh, good information in there, and um, and then the other problem we, we ran into is that it doesn't seem and I hope someone will correct me on this, but it doesn't seem that there are really good benchmark data sets for looking at uh, problems on collections of persistence diagrams. Um, so if you have some, I would I would love to to hear about that. All right, and that's all for now. So thank you.